I would yeah. like to introduce How long? Judy Smith uh, from the EU. Wow. She is the Community Involvement Coordinator. She is also a public affairs specialist for the EPA. Uh, she's here today to give us an update on the Formosa Mine project and proposed plan. <laughs> Yeah. And, and actually, uh, I'm not actually going to be doing the actual update presentation, but I wanted to, um, you know, the partnership from 12 Rivers has been involved with the um, EPA since we listed the site back in, I think it was 2008 or something, so it's been a number of years that uh, your group's been very actively engaged with this, uh, at this site, and um, on January 6th, we did um, release the proposed plan for cleanup of the surface and subsurface mine materials <coughs> at the Formosa mine site. And this is the first part of a two-part cleanup, and Chris will go into that. But um, the primary purpose of the proposed plan is it does summarize all the studies that have gone on for the last um, seven years, and then it does recommend EPA setting up alternative. But the important thing that we're looking for is public input on the, this proposal. And so um, the comment period is open until February 5th, and um, you can submit comments in writing, uh, by email, or we are having a public meeting tonight where you can also off offer spoken public comments for the record if, if that's what you choose to do. And I brought a limited a number of printed copies with me, and so um, I can kind of pass them around, and I know they uh, will probably go around, but the, the proposed plan is 32 pages, it's available online, and um, if we don't have enough copies, um, you can either go online to get it or email me, and I can uh, mail you out a copy. So, um, but uh, your, your input on this um, is really important and we look forward to hearing both your questions and um, comments that you have um, on where we're going with the surface and subsurface mine methods. So with that, I'll go ahead and I'll kind of start these around. And I'd also like to introduce Christopher Corey. I think he actually came to, he's been here a few times. Um, and he's the project manager for the Formosa Mine Site for EPA. And, um, he'll be providing um, a little more of the detail yep. uh, and we'll go Thank you, Judy. And uh, thank you very much for the amount of time you guys are providing at your meeting. You really obviously have a lot on your plates. Um, so we, I've been here in the past and I think I gave a very similar summary of what we were planning on doing because I knew uh, the results of all the work that had been done. Um, so in, on top of the proposed plan that's being circulated, there are two very large documents, not very large, but two documents called, one is called the Remedial Investigation, another is called Feasibility Study, and that gives a lot more detailed um, information about the site and what we're proposing to do. So I think most people are familiar with where the site is, it's outside of Riddle, um, it's up on Silver Butte Mine, or Silver Butte Mountain, and it's basically from the modern mining that they did, in the early 90s, it resulted in a lot of material that was just deposited throughout the, what we call the primary mine disturbance area. And that material is generating acid and releasing metals. And the three primary metals that are being released are cadmium, zinc, and copper. And copper and zinc are very toxic to the aquatic environment and vegetation in the area. So, with the solid, what I consider the solid phase, the EPA also split the site up into dealing with what's on the surface and what's in the groundwater and the aquatic system. So they, they are inter interrelated because we see the solid soils and mine, mine impacted materials as contributing to water quality um, exceedances, which we've documented in both Middle Creek and South Park Middle Creek. These exceedances prevent uh, the reestablishment of fish habitat uh, for coho salmon, for steelhead, other things. It's also, they wipe out the, um, the benthic invertebrates that live in the, in the sediments, or they're not, uh, well, they live in the streams of that area. And this kind of happens on a periodic temporal basis between uh, spring flush, winter flush, and uh, the summer when it gets dry. 
So things kind of come back, and you know, it was, a, it was a, you know, alteration. I mean, the, the, the habitat's not being restored the way it should be. So, so one aspect is this OU is going to deal with soils, and the second one is going to deal with um, groundwater and surface water. And one big aspect of the second stage of this project is we're working in conjunction with Bureau of Land Management, and they're going to be doing an activity this summer and this fall to basically seal up the Formosa One attic. So this is where we think most of the water coming into uh, Middle Creek is coming out of the mine from that attic. So it's basically, it's not plugged hydraulically, so the water overflows the top of the attic, where there is a plug, but it's not a solid plug. And the water overflows from there, and also under, goes underneath the backfill that's there. It goes directly into Middle Creek. Um, and BLM is leading that project, and Susan Lee is the project manager for that. And uh, we, EPA thinks it's a great plan, and it's going to have a huge impact on Middle Creek. We want to assess that impact before we propose a remedy for OU2, which is Operable Unit 2, for the second stage of our project. So after we did our investigation, we um, we look at alternatives to doing the remediation. And they range from doing absolutely nothing to gathering everything up and sending it off to a, a landfill outside of the area. And we go through a screening process based on protection of human health and the environment, implementability or effectiveness, and cost. So the very, very high end one was screened out as one mainly being too expensive and having um, I mean, it would have been 30, you know, thousands and thousands of truckloads of dirt moving through these roads for no real good reason, in my opinion, and EPA's opinion. Um, the material we're dealing with all came from this area, from the mine. We feel that the best, and so within those two ranges of, um, sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Between the two ranges of doing nothing and moving everything off site, there's a series of modified, basically containment in place alternatives that are in the proposed plan and in the feasibility study. And it's kind of a, a range of whether we um, do everything on site and just keep it in one location. Um, we don't really have enough room for containing everything we think needs to be contained, so then we have to look at an uh, outside disposal facility that was either on site or in the surrounding forest. And we're leaning toward doing something that's all within the disturbed area of the mine, is what our goal is. We don't really want to go out and um, clear more land to build a, basically it's a, a landfill for, for rock. And the whole idea of building a repository or a landfill is to prevent infiltration from either snow melt or precipitation from rain from interacting with the, the, the soils, which are very fine and crushed up and have a very low pH um, and leaching that material out of the groundwater into surface water. Um, so it's not a high-tech problem that we're dealing with and we think the basic solution is basically to consolidate as much material as we can on site, we put it under an impermeable cover and then we grow vegetation back on top of that. And because it's actually a functioning road bed system or road system that BLM has to maintain we're going to um, basically pave the roads and put in drainage to prevent um, infiltration through that bedrock, or not the bed, through the roadbed of this material, because that material is also made of um, mine waste. And it might, we think it's between those two, um, actually the other big main element I was uh, missing was uh, there's an area called we call the encapsulation mound, and it's basically a double line water storage facility that the mine used to process their water and maintain their water, they ended up filling that with tailings and waste rock when they closed the mine. That was covered um, and that was capped, but we don't feel that the cap is actually being is functioning properly. Um, so our proposal would be to remove all this material off the top of that, put in a better design cover material, pulling up, there is waste rock on the sides of the encapsulation mound, and um, on one side, it's significantly thick, and that, that drains the South Fork. 
which previously was not impacted by any mining activities until the early 90s. So we think between the encapsulation mound and the waste rock there, that was stem being South Fork, Middle Creek. Um, so we want to pull that material out, put a better cover over it, maintain the saturation of the tailing, which keeps them, you know, prevents them from getting exposed to oxygen. And um, that would be a permanent solution to that, and capping it and building another repository adjacent to that area. So the, the proposed plan, I'm not sure, some people might be confused by the idea of building two repositories, but one of the repositories is existing, that's the encapsulation mound, and we're going to be, we're proposing to build another one adjacent to it, or near, all within the property boundaries of FEI property, or Formosa Exploration Inc. Um, all this money would come from taxpayers, it's not, there's no viable parties, what we consider under our Superfund law, that there's no one out there that we can go after and ask them to pay for it. We've looked, we've, we've gone all the way to Japan looking for these people, and um, as of even a few months ago, we were sending letters there, and I mean, it sounds basic, but they come back, return to send you no address, or you know, no, there's no one that is any more, that has any ability of paying for this. So this is all going to be done with taxpayer dollars. Um, and the big, as Judy was stressing, the big, the stage we're in right now is really to gather uh, your input, the public's input, the community input on whether they think this is a good idea, whether the alternatives to this, um, suggested revisions. Um, Superfund is a very, it, um, we do rely on public input, um, even though it's a, you know, we're a large, you know, we're the federal government, we still do want to get this input because it really does affect how we pick a remedy. And especially when it comes to things where you're potentially driving, um, you know, there can be community impact depending on what we do. And that could be either through truck traffic or long-term dust generation. Um, all those things have an impact. I mean, this site, I didn't really touch on it earlier, but we really only see it as posing an environmental or ecological risk. There's not really the chemicals that we're dealing with and where the site is doesn't pose a human health risk, any significant risk. Um, we looked into people that might get exposed from hunting deer, and that wasn't an issue, or other animals. Um, it's really, what it does is these chemicals prevent fish from spawning or surviving in the waters that they live in. And it also kills off the bugs that fish rely on. So with that, I'd love to make any input, or, or not input, not now, but answer any questions. Is there a place that you can define where the mine problem is over and above the baseline based on what's coming through Riddle, Canyonville, Myrtle Creek, and the monitoring done there? Yes, I believe what we're seeing is higher than, in, I think Myrtle Creek is one of our reference streams. Yeah, my, my question has to do with how much of the metals in the acid mine drainage that go from Middle Creek, which we know doesn't have benthic mat growing vertebrates, right. into Cow Creek is then picked up by the processes that we currently have in our wastewater purification systems, does it affect them? No, it does not. We actually did do sampling at um, the Riddle intakes, and it wasn't... Um, I mean, it's, it's basically cow creek water. It's not okay. So the problem is confined to where Middle Creek hits Cow Creek, and, and the flow of Cow Creek is enough of a dilution that even though it does change the pH slightly, we're still in the 5, 6, 7 area as opposed to the 2, 3, 4 area? Oh, absolutely. I, okay. I'm not positive what real water intake is, but I'm, I'm assuming it's closer to 6 and yeah. yeah, and by the time it goes through their treatment facility, it has to be there, isn't doesn't it? Isn't that legislated? Probably. Yes. Okay. Under the same drinking water act. Just wanted to clarify that that we know the extent of how much contamination it actually puts into the whole system. 
Yeah, no, that is. As I mean, opposed to just up at Middle It's dramatically higher in Middle Creek and certainly in the upper stretch of the Middle Creek. And same thing with South Fork. I mean, it's, it's some of it, you, I mean, I encourage you to go, the, you mentioned you were an chemi inorganic chemist, but you will see the change in the color of the water. Oh, I've been on site. the creek comes in. In fact, it, it the natural dramatic. chromatography of that creek gives me some real ideas that we might look deeper into our explanations in biology, biochemistry, and chemistry, because I think that the explanation of what we're seeing is complete good inorganic chemistry, and that I can help you know where the deposits, what they turn out to be. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll have okay. further discussion. Doesn't Thank need you. to be here. Yeah. Um, the state of Oregon is investing considerable resources to address a potential subduction zone event off the coast, nine point magnitude. Are there? Are you taking into consideration the possibility of that kind of event in terms of the stability of your solution? It is, and I can guarantee that a nine point of earthquake would not affect it. Right. Um, it's certainly not going to be affected by a tsunami or anything like that. Right. right. But <laughs> not, um, we do have to design it within earthquake parameters, and the location where it is. I mean, there are subduction fault zones in that area, that's one of the reasons it's yeah. going to be mineralized. <laughs> so, uh, 9.0, I'd have to look back and see. So that is something that will come up in design. But there's actually a whole other element. You'll see in the proposed plan as a conceptual site model, and it has a diagram <coughs> showing where the possible extent of the depository would be. I personally think it's going to be much smaller and more adjacent to the encapsulation mound where there used to be a million gallon water tank. It's gonna, we're gonna try and have the least impact on existing vegetation that we possibly can and build it stable, you know, build stable. So a follow up to that is that your solution for the surface stuff and, and for the atom itself, you think that's gonna resolve the expression of these acid waters in other places that seem to be appearing on on the site or below down lower the soils yes we do we think we, and, you know we think if we get them isolated and prevent water from infiltrating and prevent that from happening it'll reduce the load into the middle creek and south work now reduce but not eliminate probably yeah we're not we can't guarantee 100% it will be back to what it was you know, 200 years ago. I mean, it's um, super fun as a response program. You know, we, we were handed something that was not designed to be there, and we're trying to make the best of it. But we are going to have to try and meet Oregon water quality <coughs> criteria, or we have to waive it. So that would be my next question: is reduced to what level? Yeah. Ideally, we'll meet Oregon water quality criteria. That's the goal. Um, one of the tough questions is going to be where do you try and meet that? You know, there are places where we can get water in a creek that's only six inches wide and it's not fish habitat. And I'm not an attorney, but I probably imagine the criteria apply there also. Um, but is that feasible to achieve? You know, it depends on how much money you have. And we're proposing to spend around, you know, plus or minus. You know, 30, minus 30 plus 50 percent, around 10 million dollars is what we think we can do on OU1. BLM's going to be doing some work on the ADIT, which will close off that aspect of the discharge. And then we're going to have to look at, in a few years, you know, it's going to take, I assume, five years minimum to let things stabilize and see what the hydrology does. And then we're going to have to go and look and see if we have more seeds coming out. Um, I mean, ideally, if we can keep this material in the mine itself, which falls under copper unit two, saturated and not a lot of fluctuation, it produces much less acid-laden water, and that's the passive way of treating it. We may, as we go into copper unit two, we might look at chemical introduction of 
you know, something that goes into the mine and we pump in something that would neutralize it better or encourage bacterial growth that would actually reduce the uh, metals in there. But that's going to be a second phase. Yep. Um, one of my fellow teachers who lives in near Riddle made a great suggestion, I thought. There's a huge pile of ash at those birds lumber there. No. Ash will neutralize as it was. Mm -hmm. It's right there. Yep. You could use it. We're looking into it. We're actually <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> trying to get um his name is Dr. Stephen Johnson, I believe. <coughs> Dallas, and he's with Mark Johnson. And uh, Mark Johnson. Johnson. That's it. I'm sorry. I'm but, that you know, they they need to get rid of it. Uh -huh. You've got an acid problem. And we're gonna <laughs> be looking for local material to amend yeah. the soils. I mean, that's yeah. actually a uh, biochar. Right, biochar bio works <laughs> that way. We look yeah. into that. Mm -hmm. um, we don't get specific in the plans. Uh, yeah. We're basically, the more specificity you give, the more difficult it is to implement the remedy because. Um, once we have a, what comes after this phase of the project is a record of decision where we get, we get the community's input and we evaluate that and then we EPA selects the remedy based on the state and community input or state acceptance and community input. Um, and you want to have some flexibility, you know, whether it's using ash or whether it's using manure or some other material to mend the soils, that's all going to be looked at during design. Yeah. And, um, Obviously, if there's material readily available and it's considered waste by some person, then we can buy or relieve them from it. Um, and they have an alkali problem. An alkali problem? Yeah, because when they have to get turned on. Right. Okay. okay. No, alkali so they have. Yes, they have. They have. They have. Yes. 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 Not a problem. Nope. I don't know if I can keep her on the long-term maintenance of the cap and the paved road and drainage on the road that you're talking about uh -huh. and what period of time are you <coughs> uh, basically forever forever and then uh, secure funding to uh, perform that maintenance that actually under our law it falls into the state mm -hmm. bargain they have to agree to do operations and maintenance the state does mm -hmm. yep. and will i assume then an opportunity for a local contractor to do that maintenance long term? I don't see why that would be prohibited. I mean, it wouldn't be prohibited, that's for sure. And when we did our tour up there, there was a lot of waste rock that was dumped over on the slopes that is contributing to the problem. And I haven't had a chance to look at the plan yet. Does it include recovering any of that, or is it yep. hoping that that just stabilizes long term? No, no, the idea is we're going to prioritize areas that are adjacent to the headwaters, um, and we're going to pull that back. And that's going to, that material is basically a I think it's 135,000 or 95,000, but cubic yards of that material is what's going to go into the repository. So the criteria for that is, one, it's, it's high acid generating material, it's close to headwaters, and it's unstable. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff, especially right below Formosa 1 at it, we know we're going to pull that stuff back because it goes right into Middle Creek. Um, ironically, there's another drainage just to the south of it, that we're not seeing the same effects, but that that waste rock dump is a few hundred yards away from the creek. So there's some kind of attenuation happening before that water that infiltrates that waste rock gets to the creek, and we're not seeing nearly as high levels of zinc and cadmium in there, or copper. So it's kind of, um, it's not like we're going to pull everything out and put it in this repository. We're going to be selective. Uh, yeah, the question. Do you have enough money uh, to do all this, or you have to go to Congress to get money? We have to go to Congress to get money. <coughs> but I was—I just put in Friday a request for fifteen million dollars. So find <laughs> <laughs> out tonight. I, know, I don't have that much influence. But I, I think no one's raised. Um, really an issue about that. This is not a huge expense under Superfund. Yeah. So. Um, to that end, I mean, doesn't the current owner of this property pay taxes? Uh, no, they don't. So there is no way to find these people? I My understanding is um, uh, 
I we can find some pretty nasty. Someone people. is paying the taxes, and it's not the owners. Huh, who is? So there's no there's no paper trail to the the owners that can pay for this. Correct. Because they're bankrupt, right? Bankrupt. They don't exist. But people, there's an entity that's paying the taxes, and they're not liable. They are not. They're not liable. Presumably, they bought the property after these other people. No, they do not know. Oh boy. Oh. The taxes are only about 2500 bucks, I think, a year. Um, number one, I guess this, the number one unit, I guess, the fix is mainly going to be for the self fork, right? I mean, it'll be a little bit of impact on. It should have some impact on Middle Creek, too, but I think what BLM is doing on the ad is going to have a significant impact. And then I guess what I'm getting at is that hopefully the work on unit you know, one will bring back, if you will, the self work for as much as possible. That's our early. One other question. I think that when I was working on this and you know, still in the DEQ situation, I guess, is that still the only super fun site that is an environmentally based super fun site? I guess the rest of them are all public health. Concern, I guess. Normally, <laughs> yes. I, I can't say the only one. I'm not familiar enough. But, but it's a little bit different than what a normal super fun site would more be more so on right. public health concerns and that sort of thing, right? Very often, it's much easier to list the site on and the natural priorities list based on human health exposure. Things like groundwater, direct ingestion, nearby communities. So yes, this is probably asked you before. Before too, but I guess uh, we don't have any background information on the water coming out of there prior to any mining activities. I guess I don't know what that water quality looked like prior to our involvement, someone's involvement with <coughs> goofing around with the site. Per se. No, we did. We had um, before we did the mining in the early 90s. I believe OGF and W and BLM were doing fish sampling. Right, but I guess I'm, I'm thinking of the water quality itself as this seed comes out of a, uh, a mineral formation or whatever, you know, that area that they went after, we don't really have a oh, I think on, on the water quality mm -hmm. testing itself. Not, I, I'd have to look, but there would be elevated levels of, a, of the seed coming out of a mineral rich that's what kind fracture. Of, yes. Well, that's what it's going to get you. No, no, that, that's, a, yeah, we're not, um, and we recognize that the mine is there because it's a very mineral rich environment and it made it worthwhile mining. But the difference is here they took all the tailings and they ground them all. I mean everything was ground up and put back in the mine without they were supposed to add cement and they never they didn't add cement. So it's a super fine powder they call it like four hundred mesh. So it's a really, really high surface area material like a tea bag and so it's orders of magnitude higher of reachability than you get from a normal middle yeah. surface area. It's enormous. It is. Yeah. It is. And that's kind of what, where BLM's action, I think, it, you know, we have an uncontrolled flow coming out of that Formosa one ad. And if it rains a day or two later, the, the flow rate goes from two to five gallons a minute. It can go up to 120 gallons a minute. Wow. And it's just uncontrolled water coming out of the mine that leaks through all the water walls and through all these fine sediments to go shooting out. And that's what we think we need to, well, BLM is actually taking the initiative to seal that up. Um, I thought you were going, I thought you were asking about the water quality in Middle Creek and South Fork. But he, based on the fish survey previously, like in the early, late 80s, there were reds and Large fish. Right, and then one of the members of our, our one of our directors actually couldn't be here today. He was on some of those surveying situations where they didn't see any fish and about what that age is going on. And I think both the FW or local folks came back in and did some electric fishing to find that yeah, the, the fish were gone and that sort of kind of a yep. process of going what's going on here. <coughs> Can I did mean to jump in? I was oh. piggybacking a bunch of questions. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Uh, I, I just I I am completely intrigued by this difference between the tailings in one place and the, and the other. You've yeah. got a couple of hundred yards and your water is okay on one and not the other. 
what's going on in the soil in between would be really fascinating to it know. Be is it bioremediation or is there some something? No, I think it's probably more just attenuation. Just, so it's just a filtration situation yeah. and things are, you know, I'm not an adsor adsor adsorbing onto the surfaces or something. Right. Okay. Um, or just there's enough water, more water coming in that it pollutes it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. In these diagrams, you've got the groundwater with a whole bunch of question marks. Is that to the depth of it, or uh, we can't? It's interpreted basically. Okay. We did not put okay. um, additional groundwater wells. We put a few groundwater wells in, but getting them into the bedrock aquifer is very expensive. <coughs> and is it serpentine? What's the bedrock? No, I don't think it's serpentine. I'm not. I think I'm not a mineralogist, or but it's, I don't <laughs> believe it's, it's a sulfide-rich bedrock material that it's fractured bedrock and the dilemma with putting monitoring wells in is you've got to find the fracture zone and if the fracture is only six inches wide and you're going down 250 feet to find it it was like putting you know needles in a haystack yeah um, okay so we we chose the approach we're taking is that we're going to observe the surface water and see what the quality of the surface water is and we can see in Middle Creek, it gets dramatically better, and people might not like it, but dilution is doing its effect. I mean, there's, when you have creeks coming into Middle Creek, and you can track it, and the, the remedial investigation has some great um, figures on it, and you can just see the pH going from, you know, 3 up to 4, up to 5, 6, 6.2, 6, and it just keeps going up further you go down. And before, you know, then we can't even use pH as an indicator anymore. We're looking for more of the metals. Um, and then the metals precipitate out as the pH rises. Right. Um, I don't know if that helps. But that's why we're not, for the amount of money we, to put the, enough groundwater wells in, we'd have to spend a few million dollars easily. And it might not tell us what we needed to know. It's really what we care on the groundwater is how it expresses itself on the surface. Is, I mean, I don't know, some of this groundwater might not show up until, you know, Coos Bay. But I don't, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> Chris, it might just be that you have an excellent model for the groundwater seepage if you look at Hanford, because Hanford leaked into the Columbia in 2013, and it's all radioactive. They know how the leaking went through the ground. Mm -hmm. So maybe have somebody check that out. Sure. But you're talking totally different. Geology. Well, you are, but it's the first model, model, first approximation model that's already defined. Yeah. You were going to use for the liner and the encapsulation that you can consider permanent. Right now, we don't think we need a liner for the new encapsulation for the new pond. We're, I mean, the new repository we're building. Um, the capping would be either um, geo, it would be kind of geochemical cap. It would be it could be a plastic cover. Um, polyvinyl, things like that, or clay infused where it's a, kind of a mesh um, with bentonite mm -hmm. infused into it and then you have a cover over it. Do you um, think that would never have to be replaced? No, nope, never is never a good word to use. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you know the, the pond, like the encapsulation pond that exists now was covered with standard, with lime and standard material today. Um, and there's two liners. One is a subliner and an upper liner. And it's we think it's still got its integrity. So that's you know 20 years. Um, now we live. We don't live in an era where we're going to build a Hanford cap for this. I mean, it just there's two good things going for us in some respects. This material is not like what we consider a principal waste threat. If you get exposed to it, it's not going to burn you. It's not going right. to give you cancer. It's not. I mean, you. I mean, no one would go out there and eat this stuff. But <laughs> so we we have time. So if something did go wrong, I mean, it wouldn't be like an issue of a broken drum where it would spill out of waste. I mean, I think that's the way I'm looking at it. We need to do reasonable measures to contain this stuff and keep it contained. Um, little breaches are not going to cause a catastrophic result. If that makes any sense? I mean, and, and frankly, if the encapsulation mound ends up leaching, 
or the English, and all that water comes out, that'll have an effect. But if we keep it covered, there should be no new water coming in. No, not through that. It's right on the top of the ridge. And we, they blew off the ridge to make it flat. And they dug it out and built a, a pond in it. I have this coming out in the video. Party with the water. So it's at the very top of the groundwater system. I mean, it's, and we we have wells right there, and there's never been a connection between the two. So we don't think that water rises up high enough to get into the mound. But we think water is coming into the mound. It's pretty wide. I mean, it's, oh, I don't know, it's at least 10 times the size of this space more. Um, and we go up there, you can look at it, and it's, it's accessible, it's not fenced off or anything. But we think that once, you know, we, we can build a, a very robust and technically um, satisfactory cap that will prevent groundwater from getting in there. And the worst comes to worst, if that thing leaks, you've got to put another new cap on. But that might be 50 years or 100 years. But it is forever is forever. I mean, it's, um, it's, I know it's difficult to accept, but there are certain things that happen. With, we're proposing to leave it there. And, and, keep, and we, there will be monitoring every five years. You know, we, not every five years, but we monitor it every five years. We do a, it's called a five-year review. We go back and look at our remedies and see if they're protective for human health and the environment. And if they aren't, we're obligated to go back in and fix it. We had a question. Your, your hand was up for a long time. Sorry. Just a of curiosity. About 10 years ago, I was up there, and I'm a microbiologist, and mm -hmm. I've done some macroinvertebrate work. Middle Creek was terrible. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a living thing, plant, animal, anything. And it was supposedly from heavy metals <coughs> and stuff. And then I noticed copper in there, but I didn't see any sign of riparian. No. Usually copper and plants don't get along real good. And I, it's been so long, I thought, well, maybe nothing is, it was too soon. Is there still no sign of riparian? There's not really, no, there isn't that's an impact that's to riparian environment. What's that, what's that copper not doing? It's, I don't, I agree with this. Um, there's places where Formosa one had it discharges, and there are very vibrant old growth coniferous forests growing with waste tailings up to their base. I mean, a few feet of not not a lot, but I mean, it, it, are they growing? There. Are they growing yeah. better? They're usually, <laughs> that's the <question. laughs> They might not be growing better. There is one area where um, there's a diversion pipe that takes some of the water that comes out of the mine and puts it on the hillside. And there, there is definitely impact. The, the, it's all alder and stuff. I think of alder. Um, and they're dead. I mean, it's like a small area. It's talked about in our plan, but it's about an acre. And we're going to go in there and remove that stuff too and stop that discharge. But there's not terrestrial impacts that we, sh that we showed in our risk assessment. Yeah, there was no sign it just... <laughs> Like there's, with that much copper in there, there's got to be some sign. I, I think there's enough herbicide. water wherever the trees are getting their water also from groundwater. Maybe it's not as um, contaminated. But it's sufficient. Yeah. No, no, it's all groundwater. I mean, the soil depth. Yeah, the soil depth. The poison oak seems to be thriving. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> But I was a little confused by the interplay there with uh, the BLM part, and, and so maybe I'll say what I think I heard, and you can correct me. There's, BLM's taking on that portion of the northern part, and then EPA would take the southern part? And, no. No. Okay, so does the 15 million go towards all of it, or is there more expenditure for the BLM side? There's more expenditure on the BLM side. I don't think they're spending anywhere near what we're spending. No. Um, this is a million, I think. Um, yeah, we haven't awarded that, but um, we're, we're thinking around 1.2 to 1.4 in our um, engineer evaluation cost analysis that we did for the project, but we, it hasn't come in yet, the final cost. So I guess the logical question then is, you're spending 1.2, <clears throat> everybody's spending 1.2 on the north and 15 on the south, and most of the problem is on the north. 
Um, is no. how do you? No, no, we're, that we're, 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 it's not, not a separation of north and south. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's mine materials at right the same place where BLM is going to be doing their work. It's one of the largest waste rock dumps, and we're going to be excavating that of the fifteen million dollars. I mean, in the plan it says nine point four million, but I have to add fifty percent to it, so I figured fifteen. But um, the fifteen, the OU one that I was talking about is not really broken up into north or south. It's a very, it's a kind of a nuance, but the reason BLM is doing their action is they own the property where the attic comes out, and I can't spend money there without them, because they have, it's their authority under our law, they have that authority. So they're taking the initiative to do that. I can spend money on private land, which is everything else, FEI, and I don't think anyone's going to, I can also spend money, like this, what I'm doing in this area will take the waste that they're going to pull out of the attic and put it on my prop, not my property, <laughs> but FBI. <laughs> We're to it's that a point. nuance. Yeah. But um, this proposed plan will address both contamination of the Middle Creek and South Fork. So I guess the, the last question then is, if the funding for the EPA part does not come through, would BLM proceed, and if they do, would that, how much of an impact will that have? Is that going to solve a lot of it, or not? You know, fifty percent. We never quantified it. Um, we don't know how much is going in the groundwater. We don't know how much is coming out of the mine pool. I don't know. If in some of those images you see a kind of a blob that it shows the, the mine area. Mm -hmm. That's fully saturated tailings in groundwater. I mean, that water goes somewhere eventually. Um, but I think the BLM action is going to have a dramatic effect on Middle Creek. But not, it will have no effect on South Park. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, the nickname we use for the non-time critical remover, it's like BLM is doing, is we call them early actions. And one of the, the tenets of that type of work is that it has to be compatible with a permanent long-term remedy. So, you know, it's kind of a shorter-term action um, not quite as involved with the planning process, um, but you know it contributes to the whole remedy there. And just, um, I just want to let you know, is we need to finish up at a quarter to because you. we scheduled another meeting. So uh, uh, we're we're making the most of yes, a two-day visit down here. So. Uh, one short one. Now, the fact that somebody's paying taxes on this property is an interesting nuance. Does that mean that anybody can go in there, open what you're doing up, and mine it again? Nope. We're actually going to condemnation right now. Okay. The EPA is trying to get the courts to give me. Well, we don't want the property. Um, <laughs> so, but we are trying to go through a process that gives us rights to have access to that land. Yeah. Because the private parties never responded They've never said, no, you can't come here. No, you can't do your investigation. <clears throat> There's never been a response. I mean, we've never gotten, and Boy. we did look. I mean, not, we had DOJ involved. They were going to interview people in Vancouver. That's where the, um, the people that did some of the exploration were based on. So where's the money coming from? From you. No, I don't. Oh, the tax <laughs> dollars. I mean, that ought, to, that ought to end somewhere. I don't think he wants to go there. It's All being right. paid by. Parties that don't want to, I think they're afraid of um, the land being condemned. And and that's for public record, is it not? Yeah. Okay. They should be in jail. No, no right. they're, they're doing for the best of intention. It's not an individual. I mean, I don't know. There's no reason I can't share it with you. The, the Douglas County Commission is paid for this, their taxes. They pay it so the land, they think it would get condemned. And then they were afraid they'd become land revert to the county. So they were paying, they were paying these taxes for years. Now, we wrote them a letter, we said you're not liable even if you're paying taxes, even if they don't pay the taxes, you're, you're completely free and clear of liability on the property. I, I can't tell them not to pay it. <laughs> okay, I think I want to thank you, I guess, for a presentation. Thank you very much. Community involvement.
coordinator with um, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, and I'm located in Portland, Oregon. And I'd also like to introduce um, Christopher Cora, who's the project manager for Formosa Mine, and um, he's located in our Seattle, Washington office. And just kind of an introductions here at the start, we also have um, Susan Lee and Stephen Leidick from the Bureau of Land Management, who also have a role at the site. They, they're not going to be presenting any information this evening, but they'll be available to answer questions if we have um, anything that comes up about uh, the Bureau of Land Management's um, activity on the seat. Um, a, a couple of housekeeping things. Come on in. <laughs> I started her a minute early, so. <laughs> so. I do have a sign-in sheet that I'll be using um, to update both an email or a hard copy list if you don't have email um, so that we can um, keep you updated about uh, progress that we make on the site. And then also the primary purpose of tonight's meeting is that um, we have recently released the proposed cleanup plan for surface and subsurface mine materials at the Formosa Mine Superfund site. And we have a public comment period that's open until February 5th. And one of the things that we want to do this evening is for um, people who want to make spoken comments um, for the official record, um, we have a voice recorder and the last portion of the meeting is going to be devoted to hearing what you think um, about the proposed plan or things we have. And I realize many of you, um, if you haven't seen the proposed plan yet, you might want some time to review and read it. So we have copies here and it's also available online. Um, a couple of housekeeping things first. I'll, I'll go ahead and um, kind of just circulate the sign-in list if you just want to kind of pass it up and down the road. Do you have the earlier sign-in list that I've already Yes, down? yeah. And so I'm just, for, for anybody that missed signing in when they came in and um, had a number of people come in through the, the back door, um, you don't have to sign in again. And then if you do, at any time during the meeting, if you um, decide you do want to make spoken comments, um, I use these blue cards. The only reason I use them is that I, I number them as people hand them to me, and then it gives me your name to, um, to, to basically acknowledge who you are when it comes to the public comment time. So, so any time during the meeting, you can come up and grab one of these if you'd like to make spoken comments or um, raise your hand and I can bring you one. Um, a, a few housekeeping details, um, you know, sometimes uh, people feel very passionately about um, information they hear at a public meeting, and what I would like this to be is a, a, a safe place for people to express um, opinions about um, what's the problem with the site or actions that EP or be saying, and so um, with that is if you um, make sure that if, if someone says something that you disagree with, um, just um, be respectful and um, you know you'll, you can have your turn to also say something. But um, we just want to make sure that we go away feeling like this is a, a productive thing that uh, the public comment will help shape um, the final record of decision that we use to um, <coughs> that'll that'll be the final cleanup plan for the site. And, this is truly a proposed plan um, for public comment. So I'm trying to think what I forgot. So um, the, uh, the agenda for tonight, I don't have it written down, but um, Chris is going to make a brief presentation. Um, and then we can follow that up with some clarifying questions and answers. And the risk I say that there is that we'll, we'll answer questions that you'd like to have answered um, in order to make your comments. But um, I'm not going to be starting the voice recorder up until the, um, the, the public comment portion of the meeting. And I want to make sure that we get your comments on the record. So if you ask something or say something that should actually be a public comment, um, I may ask you to, to come back and, um, you, know, or, you know, to give us that during the public comment portion of the meeting. So um, did, what did I forget that we have? I think you covered everything. Okay. So I think you go by Give my presentation, I think it'd be better. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you taking the time out for this. 
event for us. And as Julie mentioned, uh, this is a significant stage in the Superfund process. And for those who don't, don't know, but Superfund is a national um, program to clean up hazardous waste sites that have been abandoned or, um, well, they don't have to be abandoned, they're just hazardous waste sites that people are not cleaning up currently. Uh, Formosa happens to be an abandoned Superfund site. We listed it on what we call the National Priorities List in 2007, uh, partly out of, by request from the State Department of Environmental, Environmental Quality. This site has been, um, it's been mined for, oh, at least 100 years, and the most significant effects of that mining really came into play in the early 90s when Formosa Exploratory Inc. came back in and had an exploratory permit to look at an ore body, which is kind of that, looks like an Oreo cookie, the gravy bit over there on the side, the diagonal piece. Um, and they were looking for cadmium, or no, zinc and copper, mostly. Um, and so, in 94, the mine was actually shut down because they weren't meeting their, uh, their National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit for the Clean Water Act. So, there was a whole bunch of problems, and my understanding was never really a profitable mine. There's no power up there. It's pretty remote. This is, this, where this location is is about seven miles southeast from Riddle, but that's as the crow flies. It takes about 30 minutes, 45 minutes to get there by car. Um, it's on a far service road that's open. There's no fences or anything like that preventing people having access to it. So that being said, um, it still had significant problems for, and what really was causing the problems besides their not meeting their permit conditions were people noticed there were no more fish in Middle Creek and South Fork Middle Creek became denuded of fish, especially near the headwaters. And, um, also these organisms called benthic macroinvertebrates, which are basically bugs that live in stream corridors. Um, and what was doing it was, there is, well, I'll just explain it, but there were adits and the groundwater, the blue in those depictions are groundwater, and the water would flush out of the mine and go into the headwaters of the creeks at very low concentration, or very low acid levels, or low pH levels, I'm sorry, which is a very high acid level. And um, we have acid concentration, or not concentration, but pH levels in the, you know, around two. And normal water is about six and a half, seven. And that's enough to, you know, it leaches metals out of the material that's at the site. And um, those are killing fish and vegetation in the creeks. So EPA was asked to come in in 2007 and do. Um, put this on the national priorities list. And this was after actually both BLM and the state of Oregon had done, no, oh, yeah, not BLM, but EPA and DEQ had done what we call emergency removal actions, trying to stabilize it. And it became clear pretty quickly that they, we didn't, they didn't have the money to do it. Um, so they petitioned EPA to put this on the national priorities list. So the past seven years, We've been doing this investigation to determine what the contamination is and what it's doing to the environment and whether it affects human health. One of the things that we've been doing here is, um, as a management tool, we separated the sites into two management units. We call them operable units, but they're basically, it's EPA's method of, of dividing a site and um, addressing certain problems initially and putting something else off to wait and see the effects and working on that. So our OU1 is um, really dealing with soils, mine impacting material that's on the surface and in the subsurface in this area called the encapsulation mountain, which is this area. This proposal that we're doing is not the final action we're doing at Formosa. We'll wait a few years and see the effects of this action and also Another significant thing that's being done is Bureau of Land Management will be going in and reopening the attic and installing a, a real hydraulic plug. Because what's been going on is the mine pool, what we call that brown thing on the left, fluctuates in elevation of water. And every time that water goes up and down, it, um, it leaches metals out of the material that's been put back in the mine. And those materials that are put back in there 
were finely ground up rock that they removed the zinc and the copper from, and then they put it back in the mine. So it's kind of like a giant tea bag, and the water that goes in there and it flushes it out and, and mixes with oxygen and creates this acid generating um, environment. And that's what comes out of the mine and also goes through the materials that I'll, we're proposing to um, take an action on. Um, but BLM is going to be doing an action independent of EPA, but we support it. We think it's going to help our overall remedy for the site. So we want to um, assess that action that BLM is going to do and our action. And that's why we have what we call Operable Unit 2 is a few years down the road. So I don't want people to think this is it. Um, is that clear? Okay. Um, so, you know, the site's not huge. It's about 24 acres. This is the area. And we consider, when we looked at it, we did thousands of samples of, of the, um, the dirt, basically, the rock surrounding the, the site. And the big problems is it's all very low pH, which is basically a, a representation of acid in a, in a material. And it has high levels of metals, mainly cadmium, copper, and zinc is what we're worried about. And it's all through the roadways and in this encapsulation mound. But the biggest, one of the biggest problems that we're, gonna, we're facing is these um, waste rock dumps that are on the sides of the road. So when they put an added in, they just dug it out and dumped it off the roadside. And they build the roads with this material too. So that material, we feel, needs to get um, isolated, picked up, and done something with it. Um, but that's about 24 acres. It's, we think, I'm gonna try and go through how the proposed plan was written, so I'll, I'll try and stick on that kind of schedule, or summary. Um, so we know the site, it's a mining site. We know there's minerals in this area, but these minerals that we're finding here in order of magnitude are two higher than what we find in normal bedrock outcroppings. Um, so it's not simply, a mine site that's contaminated and we should leave it as that. We think that the, what they've done to the material has actually exacerbated or made the problem a lot worse because they crushed it up into a very fine material and um, it keeps leaching. So we do, uh, we go through of doing a remedial investigation, which is what we do and we collect, again, thousands of soil samples. We've done hundreds of water samples. Um, and we basically determine that yes, this material not healthy for the environment. The one good thing is we don't think it poses any unacceptable risk for human health. So it's not a, it's not a human health driver. Most Superfund sites are um, they're generally almost always listed for human health exposure. Things like polychlorinated biphenols or mercury or you know dioxins. This site is strictly a metal site. Um, we don't have mercury here, which is very good. Um, and there's very little arsenic, but it is present in one little area. And those are, but they're not, for human health, it's not driving the risk. What we're finding is the risk is really the ecological receptors, and those receptors are all aquatic. So it's the fish, and the bugs, and the, and the sediments. Um, we go through a risk assessment process that looks at hazard indexes, and it gets um, it's pretty well explained in the proposed plan. It's also very well explained in the documents that support this. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to go out there and look and see that there's no fish where there should be fish. And prior to the modern mining occurring, there were a lot of fish in Middle Creek and South Fork Middle Creek. They were a vibrant um, habitat for coho and steelhead and cutthroat trout. Um, and they're not existing, certainly in the, next, in the top three to four models now. And we'd like to restore that. So that's kind of what one of our main goals is doing. I mean, that is a real goal. There, what we have these things called remedial action objectives. And the purpose of this particular action is to remove this material that's preventing the habitat from supporting aquatic creatures. Um, and we think we can do that by managing this material in a manner that would um, prevent infiltration from occurring and with the material. Um, so after we do our risk assessments, we move on to, once we determine something's unacceptable, then we have an obligation to find alternatives to treat it. And those alternatives in our case were for um, 
Should I use that? What's that? Should I use that? No, you should ignore it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I didn't know what I was supposed so. to do with that. <laughs> um, we end up doing a feasibility study, which is basically a process of looking at alternative, different treatment techniques, process options that we think would be a, a, a reasonable solution for the problem at hand. And we have a whole bunch of criteria. There's basically nine of them spelled out in the law. And the first, the two biggest ones are protection of human health and the environment and uh, compliance with what we call ARAR, or legal requirements that are out, um, both federal, state, and local requirements that need to be met for environmental reasons. Um, things like the Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, things like that, we have to comply with, with our alternatives. And we also screen them against cost and effectiveness. We went through that process. We looked at everything from doing absolutely nothing, which would be our no action alternative, to remedies that looked at um, basically excavating everything up there and shipping it off to a landfill. Um, that alternative was deemed way more, far too expensive for the problem at hand. It was in the $25 million range. Um, and it would also have huge impacts on, we think, the community of, you know, these trucks would have to be rolling through Riddle or you know down these roads for something like twenty five thousand trucks would have to go by. Um, we don't think for the the type of waste that's present, it wasn't deemed reasonable to do that. Um, other things we look at is short term implementability, long term implementability, reduction of toxicity, volume, and waste, and yeah, um, cost is another <coughs> big element, and then state acceptance and community input, community acceptance. And that, the stage we're at right now is to gather community input on our alternatives, that we, or the, our preferred alternative. And basically, the other alternatives are really a combination of how much we pick up and how much we cover with material. I mean, build a, a cover system, like a landfill cap. Um, there are varying degrees of them, they vary. Um, the last three, the top three, three, four, and six, we, we threw out five for a different reason. Um, that was one of excavating everything and sending it off site. Um, they're about, I think alternative two is about $5 million. Alternative three is about nine and a half, ten, and four and six are also in the 10 to $11 million range. Um, and these estimates are, you know, minus 30% plus 50%, so they could, you know, if we think it could be $10 million, it could be $7 million or $15 million. Um, and basically the whole, the different gradations in there are whether we treat the material in this mound, um, and this, this encapsulation mound is basically a, an old water impoundment that FEIU, for most exploratory ink, used to um, maintain their the process water when they were doing the mining, the double lined pond that has um, two liners, but now it's filled with waste rock, tailings, and um, well, yeah, waste rock, and um, crushed up ore and stuff like that. It's been, it was capped back in the early 90s um, with a cover and then more fill put over it. But we don't believe that cap is actually functioning properly because we see a fluctuation in the water level in there. And I think of it as a big bathtub that if you overfill the bathtub and you, you know, the drain is stopped, it pours over the side. And that's what we think is happening because this cap is not keeping water from getting into this encapsulation mound. And it is getting in and it overflows and then we have um, serious impacts in South Fork, which is this drainage system, and that joins up with Middle Fork, oh, I want to say about five miles down this way. Um, so one of the big things that why we prioritize getting what we call Operable Unit 1 done is we think we can bring South Fork back into being suitable habitat. Um, one of the really important things is this drainage system is pretty pristine. It's not, um, I don't believe it's been logged, and other parties have spent money on restoring the, 
stream bed to improve it. Um, previously, it was very good habitat for fish. It's got heavy, you know, tree cover, um, and we just, you know, there's no reason it shouldn't be restored. And that's we think the source of this problem is this waste rock dump here and stuff overflowing from that. That's a big part of prioritizing um, working on that section of the site too. So as I was saying, um, oh I'm sorry, there are different things we could do in here. There's chemical <laughs> treatment you can do, you could add cement, you could add um, organic material to make it um, more conducive for bacteria that live in there and then might reduce the sulfur bearing elements of the material. But that requires actually go in there and um, potentially damage the liners. And we, we feel pretty strongly that another way of controlling acid generation out of, um, out of this material is you simply keep it submerged underwater and oxygen doesn't infiltrate because that's the only way, that's how this stuff, this process works is it needs to be exposed to oxygen to get the, the leachate to come out in a high acid and with the metals in it. So we think if we cover it and do a, a better cover basically than what was done before um, and reduce the, um, we, we also don't think it's very stable. These, this, if you ever go up there, it's just bare rock going down and it's at, at an angle of repose right now and it keeps, rainwater keeps eroding into it. and. Um, it's pretty thick, you know, 15, 20 feet of waste rock that's up there that's not controlled in any way. And we don't think it would be appropriate simply to lay a giant cover over the whole thing. So we want to excavate this material and build another repository adjacent to it. The, the stuff that's in the pond would stay there and we put a new cover over it. That would be revegetated and, and maintained basically in, perpetu in perpetuity. Um, and that would be operation and maintenance in the future. So that was a range of options we developed for doing this site. Um, EPA thinks they're reasonable options. Is for one, um, again, it's not highly toxic material. It's not like any exposure to this would result in a cancer or a, um, you know any other health problems for humans. So. It's not a, um, I mean, it, it, it's just not, if something were to go wrong in it, it wouldn't be a catastrophic issue. Is that, I don't know if that's a good way to put it. But it's, um, it's manageable waste that we, we do this very routinely at other Superfund sites that are mine sites. Like in Colorado, Utah, um, Idaho. It's a pretty, it could almost be considered a standard procedure for dealing with this type of waste is put it in a repository, eliminate the exposure to water so it doesn't leach water, anything out of it, and you deal with the draining problems that go through the roadbeds and stuff like that. So what we would be planning on doing is also um, improving all the drainage that goes through the roads and then capping those roads with asphalt and preventing water from infiltrating into the roadbed. Um, and in the process of excavating these side slopes, we'd end up stabilizing them and revegetating them or putting rock covers over them to keep them from uh, eroding off if they're you know, relatively minor in, in volume and stuff. And one of the ways we're trying to limit the proposed plan you'll see as a large area in purple that is a proposed repository. We don't think it needs to be this large. Um, this is kind of a conceptual plan, but we're trying to minimize further impacts in the area. So we don't want to have, we don't want to end up taking Silver Butte Mountain and denuding it for no reason except for, you know, if we can, if we can keep the waste in a smaller corner of it and combine these two areas that are already denuded and damaged. Um, so we're going to focus on removing material that is at the headwaters of creeks, which we know are causing impacts to the receiving water are very unstable, which would be around in these areas. If you go up there, they're crumbling away. Um, there's actually even historic, I don't know what the word is, but wooden bulwarks or wooden retaining walls that are in there that they need to get removed because they're not going to um, 
maintain their strength over, you know, in the future. Um, I kind of ran through that quickly, uh, mainly because we'd like to get people's input on it. And um, again, we have two, but we have two very large documents that have a lot more detail that's in the proposed plan. They are readable. Some of them are, some of the technical information gets, you know, not confusing, but it gets way down into the weeds about mineralogy. But it's, um, it really, it lays out the conceptual problem that we have here and why we think that solution is actually a good one for this site in particular. Any other question? It's not a public conscious question. Right. Yep. Um, as the fish come back, um, page five lists chemicals of concern. Right. What levels are you going to monitor before the fish will be safe for human consumption? We're going to be using ambient order, or Oregon water quality criteria. So there's, there's state um, criteria that Oregon is selected. Can you point out specifically which of these four? Oh, for no, I can't. Right at this point. Arsenic, cadmium, zinc. Well, cadmium, zinc, and copper, copper. would be the main ones. And I'm sorry. We didn't set cleanup numbers for the for the water in this for this um, what we're doing right now. It's a little it is confusing, but we're we're trying we're we're, we're making the connection that this material that's on the side to the waste rock on the outside is a source material to the creek. Uh, we did complete an eco risk assessment for the creeks, and I think we we did discuss it in there about there's a section about aquatic risk numbers. And um, we will have cleanup numbers for those sort for those water bodies when we do the OU2 cleanup, and they will be basically they're going to be ambient water quality criteria based on the state of Oregon. I'm just curious to know which of those four is specifically the green light before human consumption can take place. Oh, human consumption can take place now. It's not um, it's not a bioaccumulative issue. So there's not arsenic in the, in the water bodies. All those numbers that are in that table are for soils. So they don't represent what's in the water. Is that understandable? I mean, this, this whole operable unit is focused on soils and solid material that's on the outside of the mine. Because it's not important to, to measure? No, no, it's very important. In the water? And we field. have measured in the water. We have a whole RI developing, and we've, we've monitored past seven years we've been monitoring the water, but we haven't set cleanup numbers for the water at this time. Yeah, that's going to be the second step. It's the second phase of doing it. Oh, you too? Yes. And the main reason is um, BLM's action is going to, we believe it's going to prevent water from coming out of the mine in this area, and we think that's going to be, a, and if we remove this material, we want to see what that, that effect is. Um, and, and how the groundwater interact with surface water. But there will be cleanup numbers for water in the next phase. Good. Sorry if that was not clear. Thanks. Yep. Can you say again how, did I hear you said that was 27 miles? No, it's 24, about 24 acres. 24 acres. And it's about seven miles from Riddle by the crow flies. Okay, and you said you think not you personally, but I'm using you. Mm -hmm. yep. um, you think that that's what's causing the problem down below? I mean, no, no, we're very confident. Beyond think. Yeah, yes, we okay. we are confident this mine is causing this problem. Okay. There's no you question. Did, just I'm so sorry. No, you did say we think, and I'm going. Wait a minute. We're not going to do all this just on think. No, no, we're confident <laughs> that the combination of the soils and the water coming out of the mine are causing these impacts in the streams. Yeah. We don't think, we think that, well, I, I'm sorry for saying keep thinking, but <laughs> <laughs> prior to the modern mining, there were fish in these creeks at healthy levels. After the, the three or four years of mining, those fish went away, and the benthic invertebrates in those creeks disappeared. And the only thing that changed was this mine that went in the area. So after you do the cleanup action, how long do you anticipate it will be before the, um, the habitat improves? How long will it take to flush it all out? That's hard to say. Um, I would actually, you know, I'd be remiss to give you any fine number. But we're going to, we're going to, yeah, no, we think it'll be years. 
three to five years, at least five years. That's my planning purpose. For my, what I've been telling my management is, is when we're going to, we'll be monitoring this continuously through the process and after we've done with this remediation, this phase, and we'll, we'll still be monitoring the creeks and the seeps and the springs that come out. Um, and we're going to want to see how this stabilizes. It's going to be a big effect on the system. So I just, you know, I think that should take at least five years just because, you know, temporal variations, you have a drought right now. Um, you know, we've had measures of water coming out of the Atta at 120 gallons a minute. We haven't seen that in five years. But a few years, seven years ago, it was a wet year and that thing was gushing like, you know, a lot. So we, if you get that one year, it can wipe out the creek for numerous years. So we don't have a finite number, but we think it will take time. We don't think it'll take a hundred years. We think, it'll, I mean, and we, we do see fish coming back up right now. So I mean, there is some adaptability in the fish. It just, I think that's kind of an effect of it of being in a drought right now. That the, it's really the worst, of the, the worst that comes out of this mine is in the spring runoff after the winter, when you have snow cover and you get a spring rains, and mine pool will change by 20 feet, 7, 15 to 20 feet, it'll go up. And all that water comes out of the attic, um, pretty uncontrolled. So when that happens, it has a huge impact on the aquatic environment, and that takes years to recover. Does that answer your question? A little bit. Yeah, it, it did, but you know, there's a, I, other people need to ask. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry. Is the legal environment in the present day such that this could not happen now? No. If the miners are out there doing the same thing. I don't know about anywhere else, but I. Um, Present day mines should have, I and mean, this is a modern mine. This was, this was under our, our current regulatory scheme. The Clean Water Act was in place. CERCLA was here, or my Superfund program. The Resource Conservation Recovery Act was here. It didn't prevent it. So, I, you know, I'm not it's saying all mines are like this. I'm just saying that this mine one of the reasons they shut it down was because it wasn't meeting the permit conditions. Yeah. And who's they? Uh, Formosa Exploration Inc. The people that they they no longer exist. No. The, 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 who's they that shut it down? Oh, DEQ shut them down. Yeah. And Dagami, I think they were. Yeah, they weren't meeting their per they weren't meeting their permit conditions for operating. And they had a mine. They had a. I, I could touch on that. They had a one million dollar bond to restore the site. And with that $1 million bond, they basically did the covering of the encapsulation mound, and they did some piping into the um, attic to try and control the leachate coming out. And their, their treatment technique did not work. It, it fouled up, it plugged, and within six months to a year, they had contaminated waters coming out uncontrollably. And then DEQ did a whole bunch of emergency removal actions um, if you look in the RI, the remedial investigation, you'll see there are points where it, it blew out and all these fine tailings went down Middle Creek. And it was a, it, it really devastated. It had a, a big solid load that went into Middle Creek. And there were people in there with five gallon buckets and trowels scoop, scooping the stuff up. But that $1 million went pretty quick. Um, it was insufficient to cover the effects of their mining activity. You're talking about the one million that DEQ did in the first go round, where they did the study and then put the limestone troughs in. Mm, I don't believe. I think this was all money spent by the GAMI, or they might have liberated to DEQ. I'm not yeah. positive about that. Well, do, do, my understanding of it is that the um, the GAMI was in charge of the original reclamation plan, right? And Formosa actually did do the reclamation plan to the GAMI's plan, right? And uh, um, but that obviously it was the, the geology of the mine was not as well understood as you've done. You've done a lot more work on understanding the geology of it than I think had ever been done before. 
And then some years after that, DEQ came down with uh, some orphan funds, some state. That could be. That was not the million dollars I was referring to. That, yeah, so it was a separate action that, that DEQ did a number of years after the mine yep. closed. And um, they essentially spent a lot of money studying it. Yep. And then their remedial action was just very small scale. And uh, again, I don't think that there really was enough exploration to know the, the nature of the adits. I mean, it's really excavated. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the dynamic of the drainage. And I remember sitting in those meetings, and there were uh, a lot of old timers that came to that meeting and said that, don't forget that there's always been a seat coming out of that mountain. That there's mm -hmm. always been a certain amount of drainage just because of the geology mm -hmm. of it and that it's been mined for so long. Right. No, I don't disagree with that. And I, I um, this came up at a meeting this morning with her uh, partnership for the Umpqua Rivers. I don't know if we'll stop all water coming out of that mine. I don't think that's a reasonable goal. I think a reasonable goal is to restore the habitat for the fish and the bugs in a manner that's consistent with the surrounding area. Because you're right, there's going to be, it's fractured bedrock and there, there are going to be seeps that have elevated levels of metals just naturally, um, whether it was mined or not. But this release is much more significant when it when it really when the water level goes up in there what's coming out of that mine what's coming off of the the waste rock is much more significant than seeps that we, we've actually looked at other seeps and we don't see levels approaching these concentrations i mean and, and unfortunately um you know it's a decision by epa to separate the site into soils and water so we do have a lot more, I wish I could, um, I mean the, the actual ecological risk assessment for OU2 is in the record, so it's available to look at, and that gets into a lot more detail of what you're talking about and what you were asking about on um, the impacts to the aquatic system. It's really, it was really timing that it, it, we wanted to keep this on track. Um, we could have delayed it and tried to incorporate that other information, but that would have been like another year delay. And I didn't think we needed to do that one. We feel pretty strong that by removing this material, it'll have a big effect on the overall watershed. Stan? Yeah. Um, we know that copper has an effect on a lot of families. Mm -hmm. uh, it disorients some of the stuff. Is there a particular standard uh, mineral uh, saturation that you guys are hoping to achieve, or is it just going to be an encapsulation and then a measurement? And I, I guess what I'm postulating here is that the fish could return and the macroinvertebrates could return, but are we still having an adverse impact on the code? We're going to apply what the water quality criteria that the state has adopted for protecting that, those species for coho. So I don't know off the top of my head what the copper standard is. I think it's around, I might be confusing with mercury, but I, 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 I don't know what the, the concentration is. But that would be what we would be trying to achieve in our overall remedial action. The overall goal would be to have concentrations in the surface water that do not exceed water quality criteria. If we can't meet those, EP has an obligation to waive them. And we, we can do that. We might, um, but this is again, not for this operable unit. This is gonna be in a few years. Um, you know, there is, one of the things that's interesting on the site is there's an area that is above what we call Rain and Bear Falls, which probably means nothing to anyone here, but it's a, an area where bedrock outcrops on Middle Creek. And it's about a 10-foot drop. So there's no fish living up in there. Um, and that's really close to the site. It's, you know, it's, it's probably somewhere around here. Um, so I don't know if we're going to achieve water quality standards in this creek. And if we can't, we're, we're going to have to waive them. Or we're going to have to have a really good reason why we can't achieve them. Because the state of Oregon has these 
criteria that we are obligated to meet, or we waive them if we have a good justification. And that would have to come through a whole new meeting like this. But the, the thing to consider, in my mind, is it's not fish bearing habitat. Um, they might have bugs in there that might fall down and get into the fish, which is good, but um, it's not spawning ground or anything like that. It's very, very, very steep, and the creeks you know, may be this wide. So it's a question, you know, I'm sure my lawyers or my attorneys will, you know, put me over a rotisserie for saying what I'm saying. But um, it is a possibility. We may not be able to achieve those goals because it's a mineral-rich area. Um, or, you know, we don't have a way of treating it very well. I mean, we looked into a whole bunch of, and I'm kind of getting off topic into what we're looking into Opera Unit 2, but we've been looking into a lot of what they call passive bioreactors, means of treating the water passively through like engineered wetlands, things like that. Um, it eliminates the oxygen in the water and it enhances microbial activity. We, we have really good success with doing that. We did some treatability studies that we think are, could be applied here. We want to see what the water, what the quantity and the water quality is after we do these actions. Because it might not be necessary. The fish might come back and it might be equivalent to what it was in 1990 or 89. Um, kind of that yep. Is this what is called bioremediation by others? No, what, no, for what I'm doing, right, this, this action for OU1 is simply, it's called dig and haul. You know, you dig the stuff up, you move it somewhere, you cover it. And and you, you, you were just talking about a passive. Yeah, that would be, that's something we looked is at. Is that get a bioremediation or what no, is that? <laughs> not really. Most people, it could fall into that category. I mean, it depends on how you want to define it. Okay. It is biologically treated. A lot of people... No, it can fall into that category. Absolutely. And could you explain what that is? What what you're doing there? With well, we're not doing it here. Well, anywhere. I oh well, in this case, what you do is you one. you create an environment that's conducive for sulfur reducing bacteria to live in, uh -huh. and you do that by adding manures, um, protein. Um, you have to control the pH, raise the pH a bit so that these organisms can live in it, and um, they basically go in and they, they alter the sulfur and make and they take the zinc and stuff like that and, and and I think they reduce it into a different mineral form that's insoluble and it, it it's no longer dissolvable in the water if as long as the water stays above a certain pH, which normally we don't get water that's a pH of two and three. Um, I mean, we've, We've sampled the streams and the creeks, and we have pHs in the threes, and that's really, really low. So you can dissolve metals in that, aluminum, iron, copper. Um, so we need to raise that up into a, a normal, a more natural, neutral range, and then those metals can't be in the solution. And that's what these bugs do in this, what we call them bioreactors. And we did it, we did it, um, it wasn't super successful, but we did some treatability studies up there, and we had more, I would consider it, plumbing problems and making the thing work because it kept fouling and the lines might have been too small. Um, but when we did get a sample out, we were getting 90 plus percent removal, 95 percent, 99 percent. So it was really, it's very, it's very effective. It just, you gotta have the space to do it in, and you gotta build stuff, and. That's what we're going to evaluate when we get to the next phase in OU2. I don't want to get, I mean that's kind of, that's really the more exciting part because this is really simply we're saying we need to manage this, the surface material that's around the site and get it out of the way and make it non-reactive to the environment is the goal of this, this phase of the project. And the second phase will be looked at with what BLM does and how this you know, moving all the surface material out of the, you know, from eliminating from precipitation and stuff is really the goal. That um, it'll take one of the questions out of the equation. Is we know, I mean, there's no question that 
that big blob is it's packed full of tailings. And if we don't control that, we're always going to have a problem. And that's kind of the big goal that BLM is undertaking. And then we're going to assess that effect on the creeks and the water bed, the, water, the receiving waters. If that does that make sense? Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, Christopher, I really appreciate what little I understand of the engineering of all this, but now can we move over to a different kind of question, and that is the social side of an enterprise like this. To what extent are you over the years going to involve other interested groups in the community in thinking through these solutions and monitoring and testing? We'd love to have more engagement, always. Um, this, the, the meeting like this are part of that. If the community wants more of these kind of events, um, we're more than happy to facilitate that. We don't have a lot of, um, I mean, we, EPA is encouraging and trying to do our contracting so that we, we can try and have them, um, you know, favor local businesses or favor local parties, but we're restricted by what they call the federal acquisition regulations. So I can't say you can only hire people from Riddle. Um, these go out, basically to do this work, we're most likely going to contract or have an agreement with the Army Corps of Engineers, and then they have a series of people that are on, um, that they contract with. And we do have programs in Superfund to train people to work on hazardous waste sites. In this case, I don't think it's going to be that difficult, you know, really we're talking about earth moving work. It's not, um, I wouldn't consider, like I got, I've gone to the site many times and I don't have a Tyvek suit on and I don't have a respirator, I mean it's, it's not a human health risk. So when people are going out there, um, the work is going to be earth moving and engineering a cap over the facility. So it's not, um, not like running a an advanced treatment plant or you know uh, something of that nature. And I, that and and we would if people want to um, propose community volunteering. I mean, type of a monitoring program or something like that. We're very willing to entertain that. Um, we do work with the Cow Creek Tribe in our monitoring. They come out there and help us. Um, DEQ does. BLM does. Um, we have certain restrictions because we can't, I, I can't invite school kids to come out on the site and do work. It's just a liability issue. But I don't know if that answers your question. Nice but we really like to have, you know, we want it to be beneficial for the community. So. I'm kind of confused you now, Tom. It seems like you're saying this is not the big of a deal. And Oh, I didn't mean to imply that. I'm okay, because uh, um, every time I drink a glass of water from the, the water grid or water supply, you know, in the back of my head, I start going, gosh, you know, I wonder how much lead or how much whatever is leaching out of this mine site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get the reports, so I understand that the water supply is tested, um, but still not meeting DEQ. Guidelines for water quality is a concern to me as a no, no, they are of the water. Oh, I didn't mean to imply that at all. Riddle's water supply is safe. There's no, we we're not measuring any levels of metals coming out of this mine that are showing up elevated in Riddle's water. Um, it's zinc, copper, and cadmium is what we see in the water that's elevated. There's also iron. Um, I think those are exactly the biggest one, but iron is not, um, it doesn't fall into the safe drinking water act as a maximum contaminant level. So that's what they use, and Riddle has to meet what they call maximum contaminant levels in the drinking water, and they monitor for metals and, you know, E. coli and other things, and I'm confident there's, oh, I don't know about all the other stuff, but this mine, you're not going to find metals going into Cow Creek that are going to be measurable at the Riddle intake above levels that are um, unacceptable. So with that said, um, this is going to carry a, a fairly sizable monetary impact, yep. capping this and fixing it. What kind of enforcement actions are being taken 
to track down the former owners of Formosa um, mine, whatever, and try to get funds out of the defunct company or the mm -hmm. CEO or whatever. Or well, it's we put a lot of effort into it. We requested all their financial information. We looked at it. They went bankrupt. They dissolved their corporation. Um, their CEOs are in Japan. That we don't really have access. We can't go after. Them. Not even. They were never even CEOs of Formosa Exploration Inc. Um, it truly falls under an abandoned site based on corporate law. We don't think we can pierce what we call a corporate veil. That the assets of this company are dissolved. It's just there's nothing there. I mean, we can't go and arrest someone and say you're going to jail for this. Um, what they did was legal at the time. They were operating on, under the permit conditions. And um, unfortunately, that's not unique in our current system. I see government getting bigger and bigger. I have some concerns. Um, we live out in Dixonville. We've been very concerned about our neighbors in Riddle and our neighbors up in Sutherland because of the different type of um, things that took place there with coal or mining or whatever. And I'm also a licensed nurse, and I've been in the Army 40 years now. I'm still in the Army. And as a nurse, as a corpsman, um, it's very serious, the water that I drink. And we end up by having our Dixonville Association water uh, grabbed up by Roseburg. And I, we found our fees went way up because they said they had to put in all these pumps and everything. And I started testing the water and then checking with some of my patients that, had, that live in Riddle or that lived out in uh, Sutherland and finding the count cancer rates between my neighbors in Riddle and my neighbors in Sutherland was just zooming through the roof. Thus, we have this beautiful cancer center sitting right next to Mercy, okay? And what my concern is that if the state lands, because I'm sure you work with state lands, right? Nope, no. Not at all. So you have no, con if you have uh, contact with Army Corps of Engineers, yep. but you have no contact with state lands whatsoever. I don't work with state lands. Not at all. Okay, so you have no contact. There's no letters that go back and forth or letting them know what you're doing or anything like that. There's no communication whatsoever. I work through the Department of Environmental Quality. It is my main contact with the state, and that's, that's primarily it. They work, we, we work at DEQ, state lands. I, I don't have a we, we live on South Deer Creek. And we have a particular neighbor that has been polluting water by putting dead deer carcasses in our creek and concrete in our creek. Uh -huh. And that's the trout, as you know, in salmon run. Right. So we know, as you know, we do our gold pan. We know not to gold pan that. We, not, we don't mess with our creek. But when they are deliberately throwing things in the creek and diverting the creek where it's washing away our, our, our livestock pasture uh -huh. and our orchards, and we have state lands that come down and Army Corps of Engineers go, we don't care. We've got other things we want to deal with, okay? So I'm not too terribly impressed with a lot of the alphabet soup agencies, including no. EPA or anything else, because we contacted EPA, we contacted State Land, she came down, she took a look and she took off, and there was, our reports keep mis you know, disappearing. Mm -hmm. We filed paperwork for emergency to get in the creek and work on those months of July or whatever, and we did nothing but silence. We called the Army Corps of Engineers in Eugene. So I'm not really, whatever contact you're going to be having with the Army Corps of Engineers and or whoever the EQ like we have, right. okay, I'm not impressed. So I'm concerned that my neighbors here on Riddle, they're going to get the same kind of bubblegum crap that I've been hearing for 10 years mm -hmm. living on South Deer Creek. That's why I'm, I'm here for my neighbors in Riddle. I've never lived in Riddle. Mm -hmm. I don't have any contact with Riddle. I don't work here. My kids don't go to school here. But I have seen the kind of lip speak that has been going on for 10 years with us neighbors on South Deer Creek, what happened to the people out Winchester, what happened to the people in Sutherland, and I'll be damned if that's going to happen to people here in Riddle. Yeah, I'm sorry. And then can we talk with you afterwards because, you know, our, Christopher's a, the project manager for Formosa Mine, and so I know. Well, some, I'm some of the work with Army issues. Corps of Engineers, then I want yeah. to make sure that the Army Corps of Engineers is being honest with the public as well. That there's a good communication going, not just up and down, but side to side like right. a well, right. Yeah, I was going to say is I think there's probably others in our agency that might be doing that coordination, and so that's I think why we can right. get in touch with the, you know, the right people. I just don't want to see more of the same ball being okay. dropped that mm -hmm. I see happening all over the state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the input. I don't. I mean, again. Um, We'll be using the Corps of Engineers most likely as a contracting vehicle. 
not an EPA will always be the communicator. I mean, we're going to be, this is our project. We will not um, delegate out community, community relations or engagement with people. I mean, it's our message. It's, um, I'm very sorry to hear you have those experiences, but I'm not the only one, know, sir. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just, it, these ABC agencies are very big and Superfund, um, I think it's kind of unique for agencies in that we have a very strong community engagement mandate in our law. So we do take very seriously comments we receive on our, our plan, what we're doing, but what you're talking about is not really related to Formosa. So um, Judy's right, we should get, you know, we'll try and get someone that can answer your concerns and not just disappear. But I can't promise anything. I mean, oh, it's I not don't. my program. So. No one's asking for promises. That, just more communication. Okay. So it's almost 7.30. And so um, unless anyone has any burning questions, and I think we should transition into the public sure. comment portion of the meeting. And, um, and we can hang around afterwards for more questions, too. So. Did you have one you wanted to? Yeah, I just had a question about plugging the attic. Um, I know you guys uh, talked about the possibility that that's going to push the water to go elsewhere. Yep. It's the site. I'm assuming the, the, the site is, uh, is, is porous and fractured enough that it could create a, a problem with water seeping out in other areas. We think, and I don't want to put words in BLM's mouth, but I think, yes, we have to be cognizant of that and we're going to be looking for it. Um, the idea, I mean, it's fractured, but we don't think it's like broken up into gravel. I mean, it's some major fracture lines that will, we think those are what's coming out in seeps currently. Um, but no, that is part of our monitoring plan. Is to, we don't think it's going to be static. We think that when we plug that at it, the water level is going to rise and it's going to change the conditions that we see currently. That's why I didn't want to keep proceeding with what what I call OU2 because things are going to change and we want to assess the effects of that in the future. So yes, you're absolutely correct. We It might even come out, if you look at the diagram, there's a, a higher attic called Silver Butte attic. There is historic information that water has discharged out of that attic. Um, that's where you're going to want to assess that. And it really comes back down to, um, we might not, I'm not going to be able, I'm not going to say we can cut off all water coming out of that mine forever. But if we can reduce the volume dramatically to where it's little seeps that are, you know, can, you can collect in a gallon bucket, the environment has, a, has an adapter, um, what's the right word, an ability of absorb, of, of managing small volumes of waste like that. I don't think it's, um, as a, I think someone else was mentioning earlier, there's always fractures that had mineral rich water coming out of them. Um, I don't think it's going to be nearly as bad if we prevent it from just coming out like an open pipe. But no, you're, you're correct. We, we will have to assess that. And that's part of our monitoring plan. We'll be doing that um, in the near future, actually. We want to see where the water goes. And we do have monitoring wells right in the mine that um, will tell us that. Yep. So, so how, how quickly do you see this first stage uh, being completed? Optimistically, if we get our money, we're looking at, we're hoping in 2017, 2018, we should be doing work. The next phase is EPA has to do um, what we call a record of decision. It basically memorializes the preferred, or the remedy that we want to do with public input. I mean, it could all change. You guys might say, we hate this thing, we don't want you doing anything up there, or we want you to um, take it all and turn it into glass. We have to respond to that. We might not do what you're asking. We might say, you know, it's technically infeasible or it's economically infeasible. But, um, so once, I'm sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, we have to write a record decision and then we have to go out and design it. And a design, we think the record decision hopefully will get signed by this year, by the end of this year. Um, design should take about a year. It's not 
overly complicated. It's really just an earth moving activity. So that would take up 2016, and then we think we should be in the field in 2017. And, and then, if, if you get it completed, how long are you going to monitor it before you... Oh, forever. No, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, until you start your second operation. We'll be monitoring it continuously until then. And then I'd say, you know, I, I can't be positive. Two or three years would look at, at seeing... Is what you're kind of expecting. Yeah, I'm, I'm really... I'm, I don't mean, don't mean to point at BLM, but... <laughs> we think that BLM's activity is going to have a significant impact on Middle Creek. And we think our impact over here is going to have a significant impact in South Fork. So we should see some effects in South Fork within five years. And by that you mean positive? Positive effects. Yeah, we think, um, you know, there's, you can see when you, there's a little road here that you can walk down. And you can't drive down it, but it's, um, all the culverts are they have no bottoms. They're all been <laughs> eroded out. It's been bright. They're bright pink, and they're just open bottoms because of the acid that comes off of this these waste rock dumps. We don't see it over here. We don't see it over here. You know, it's only below this. Um, and then when you get down here, the river runs white. It's so there's so much aluminum in it. Um, it looks like diluted milk. We think that when we deal with this and fix this leaking and get rid of all this waste rock material and cover it, um, we're expecting to see a pretty immediate effect. And there's going to be residual stuff in the groundwater and stuff that it takes years to move through it. But it's a relatively, um, you know, the groundwater is only moving through fractures. So it's a lot faster than if you had a typical groundwater system that would be clay and sand and, you know, mud. It's different hydraulic conductivities. We think it'll be pretty rapid. You're saying aluminum? So much it makes the water quite? Yep. How'd that creep in here? I thought we were dealing with cadmium and the... The aluminum wasn't posing an unacceptable risk. I'm sorry, the only thing we listed in the, um, in that table is values that we had numbers for that were toxic to aquatic creatures. And that aluminum is a natural yep. phenomenon. Oh, yeah, majority oh, rocks in Western Oregon are aluminum silicates. Oh, yeah. yeah, they're standing on aluminum white. Right, so there's a lot of other metals in there, but we only, I should have clarified that, I apologize, but the remedial investigation, we looked at, oh, at least 15, 20 metals. I mean, we looked at mercury, arsenic, I mean, there's, we looked at silver, everything that's on our metals list. We didn't look at uranium, we didn't look at radon. And I could rate on top of metal. But we didn't look at some of these other things. But there's a, a slew of other metals that we can see in this. It's just they don't have a toxic, the levels that we were finding don't have toxicity to fish or benthic invertebrates. So the only ones we listed are ones that we have toxic values for. Mm -hmm. But we know are toxic to fish. I'm sorry. So as lay people are concerned, this is going to just be a matter of putting a genie back in the bottle and popping a cork back on so the damage stops. Right. Yep, I agree. I haven't read the executive summary yet, but um, are you going to be having a geologist from BLM on site with you most of the time to be able to consult? Um, um, or will they just be called upon periodically or what? I, I don't know. I, not, we weren't, BLM is a support agency right now. We have USGS is on under a grant with EPA to help us. Okay. Um, but we, Possibly, I don't know. It's kind of a design issue. We really worry about the stability of what we're going to build. We want to make sure it's on stable ground. It's not going to be, um, it's not going to slide off the mountain, basically. Um, and also, you know, earthquake. It's got to be designed, you know, resist earthquakes and stuff. Thanks, Chris. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the? Uh testing being done with biochar and how that may be used in remediation in the future? We didn't do any testing under this, under my program. We did try and get a grant through EPA, through my, you know, again, we have a lot more ABC agencies within EPA that give money to EPA. So it gets, but we tried to get a grant. We didn't get it this year, but there are two gentlemen 
Um, one out of OSU, and I, well, I think they both have OSU, but one's with um, named Mark Johnson and Steve Griffin. Is that right? Or did I get the names of reverse? Griffin, I think. Steve Griffin. Um, and they're doing a lot of work, and we've given them soils from, they've actually gone up to the mine and gathered up soils, and they're growing things like ryegrass and at different concentrations of biochar. And they're very optimistic. They're sitting there telling me, Chris, why can't we do more here? And um, we're going to have to have some amendments for the soils up there. We're not specific what they are. I mean, it could be, you know, traditionally you look for amendments, organic material that's locally based, whether it's manures, potato waste, whatever it is, we try and find. So there's no reason we wouldn't look for, if there's a good source of what you call biochar available, um, that could be a component of an amendment. But we have not done, there's no, there's no information in my record that says biochar works here. Yep. Yeah, uh, I was at your meeting in Roseburg today. And, um, who owns this property now since Formosa is out of there? As far as we know, it's abandoned. So the no. property just, nobody owns it? Nobody owns it. We are trying right now to get access to the courts as a condemned piece of property. We, there's a process, and I can't remember the term. I'm not an attorney. But it doesn't sound like condemnation, but it's, it's basically condemnation to the courts, that we're saying there's no entity here that is taking responsibility and we need access, that's the big deal, is in the past we've written letters to them and they, they come back, return to sender, no, no one here. Um, and the Department of Justice has looked into it and they don't think it's, we're going to find a responsible party, um, but we, the land is basically abandoned. Um, I don't expect them to come forward. But we're, we're trying to condemn it, so we, so what we build on there, we have control over. EPA is not going to take the land. I think most likely it goes to a third party, a trust, will will create some kind of trust bid. And the county doesn't want it. No, nope, the county doesn't want it. I don't think. So does the BLM own part of it? Yep. And they'll keep owning it. You have a question. Yep. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, I guess what I would like to know is, uh, how did this ever happen to us? Who is supposed to be responsible? I mean, it seems to me like we've got all kinds of agencies constantly. We're hearing this agency does this, this agency mm -hmm. does that. I would think us citizens have a right to really get down on somebody about why this has happened and to make damn sure it never happens again, excuse me, French, but uh, I never want to see anything like this happen again. I've been hearing about this for years. Mm -hmm. And um, I would also like to say, I happen to be the president of an organization, we make biochar, and what we do is we teach people how to use it. We, we are non-profit, we're not in work, we are into educated. I really suggest to me, uh, I just keep thinking biochar, biochar, you know, that's acidic, that will take care of the acid, you know, uh, it's a real soil amender. Mm -hmm. And also I hear that they, that um, Roseburg Lumber, and I suppose all the lumber yards around have excess um, ashes. Okay, I'm going to... I don't know, I'm, I'm, uh, I suppose my question, and I want questions from us and not statements, and I'm afraid I just made it. Well, that's exactly why I hopped forward with my card, because I felt that that was a comment that would be appropriate for you to make into the record, you know. Tom, um, I'm doing is appropriate, that's... Well, well, <laughs> And so, and, and kind of as I threatened to do about 10 minutes ago, um, why don't we transfer? But the yeah, yeah, answer to yeah. who, who was responsible for this never to happen? I mean, it's Doug Ammy. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. If Doug Ammy had never told him to put the fines back into the mine, we would not be looking at this. Mm -hmm. Department of Oregon Geology and Minerals. I tell you where the apartment. Well, the problem was there was not ready to do that. It was the use of cyanide to move forward. So most of the point, 
I brought in a couple of quick samples here. We mined out uh, basically the high copper, excess for areas built. These copper rings more run. And then we moved into the zinc areas. So the zinc areas are polymetallic. I just brought some rocks so you can feel free to go look. The copper, the, the yellow stuff, the zinc, the blacker stuff. It's polymetallic. I actually have one of those pieces there. I'll show you the difference between the two areas. I'm representing nobody. I like the responsible party. I had my passport was locked up in my car. All I was was a surveyor. But at the point that they got to the polymetallic material, they were going to be allowed to use cyanide on the field. That's a common method of waste free town. That's a common method of getting gold worldwide. They got that point. And uh, the Oregon legislature came up and passed something called the Anti-Chemical Mining Initiative. They passed that, made those chemicals illegal. There's that all chemicals now in the process of the course of the they're illegal. And they said, you cannot process that for the gold and silver. But you've worked all this time to get through your sandwich to finally get to your, your cookies and your cupcake, and they say, you, you can't do it. And at that point, they just turned on the yeah, just to that, that thing it would still be operating to this day. I, I, I'd like to suggest that we maybe continue this yeah, back yeah, with your public comments for the record. Yeah, and we, just so just we don't, educating us. Yeah, so we no, 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 but I, I just like to, you know, the, one of the primary purposes for our meeting is that um, we do want to take comments for the record, and, and it is important. This, this and conversation, we do that. It's just that another one now. Um, sure, and. Um, Okay, and so, so what I'd like to do is, yeah, just make sure that we, um, you know, what we have is a, a proposed plan on the table, and what we'd like to do is hear comments, um, whoever would speak them tonight about um, the proposed plan, plan for cleaning up the surface and subsurface mine materials, and then we can just hang around as long as you want and, and maybe talk more about the history of the site. And, um, some of the efforts that EPA and other agencies went through to um, find responsible parties and make them liable for paying for the, the cleanup under the Superfund law. Um, but um, I would like to go through this. Right now I have three people that um, indicated they want to make comments for the record. Is there anyone else um, who'd like a card? Um, I just use them to, so I have people's names. So, is there My name's Izzy. Can you just put M.A. down? Okay. <laughs> All black. And anybody else? Um, and just for the whole time we're doing this, go ahead and uh, if you want to come up and... Uh, How long will you be accepting written comments? Because I couldn't download the plan tonight. It wouldn't, the system wasn't working. Till, um, the comment period's open until February 5th. Okay. And so, um, yeah, we're about... Uh, 10 days into it. Now, actually, for um, what we do is this is um, a, a, a kind of our, one of our formal. Um, and I'm sorry, did you say MA or MJ? M period, A period. Okay. And so um, I actually have um, kind of a script here. I'm going to be recording this with a digital voice recorder. Um, when you make comments so that the recorder picks you up, um, it'd be great if you could come and, and stand kind of over on this side of the room. It has a, it's pretty good for 10 to 15 feet, and then after that, it, um, it fades a little bit. So, uh, so I'm going to start the recorder now, and then um, I'm going to kind of go through all my uh, legal requirements stuff here. And so, I'm now opening the meeting for public comments so that EPA can hear your thoughts and concerns about the proposed plan for surface and subsurface mine materials at the Formosa Mine Superfund site. And so I am recording this part of the meeting by digital voice recorder. And um, this will become part of the formal public record for this project. And we do want to make sure that we capture your comments accurately. And so um, please speak slowly and clearly. Um, we do want um, everyone to have the opportunity to express their views um, and give us any really new information or considerations that might help us improve um, the final remedy that we select for the site. Um, during this process, we're not, Chris is not going to be responding to questions. 
Um, how he'll do that is that the comments that we receive, and we, and we can receive them in writing later um, by email, um, we can speak them here tonight. Um, if you don't like speaking in front of people, um, we'd be happy to sit down and just have you talk to us and the recorder after the meeting in a more comfortable environment. You know, the primary purpose is to um, hear your thoughts and so that we can make this. So the deadline is? Uh, Tuesday, February 5th, and um, let's see, we did put a notice in the paper in the Roseburg News Review, yeah, I lost my place so much for my script, um, <laughs> uh, in the Roseburg News Review on January 6th, and so we will have, we have a, this will be a 30-day public comment period. Um, so what I'd like to do at this time is um, call um, our first commenter, and it's um, uh, someone who I know is Dr. Lenny Time, and it's Lenny uh, Schussel. Yes. So. Hello, everybody. I'm a PhD chemist out of Oregon State University. A bit of my background is that I work for Uncle Research down in Myrtle Creek as a R&D scientist in developing methods for water purification. I then worked at the Glenbrook Nickel Company here in Riddle for many years as an analytical chemist. I then worked at the Wildlife Safari, working with kids' math and science programs. I have been looking at the Formosa site since the mid-1980s when I used to hike up here, before Formosa got here. So I know there were fish in the creek. I've been involved in a lot of this process all the way through. This is one of the finest proposals I've ever seen formulated by our federal government. Chris has taken the time with his people to really address issues that the Department of Environmental Quality in this state would not address by splitting up this into two different ODU units. What he has essentially done is taken the problem of the dirt on the ground that was scattered here and there and is going to concentrate it into a reservoir where there's only one place that will be holding most of the contaminated dirt and the only contaminated dirt that won't get there is if they're going to have to actually break more rock to get the dirt up, in which case it's already rock, and they don't have to move that. But the idea of plugging the attic that BLM has here, it could very well backfire and change a lot of things going on in the dynamics of the system. My personal belief is that the fissuring in the system down here, underneath the mine on the way to the creek, is almost an open flow channel. Mm -hmm. And that we are not going to have any luck trying to actually cut off that flow of the groundwater, OU2 stuff, until we actually address that specifically. And none of that is even part of this proposal. That's the next one. Mm -hmm. So let's agree to leave that behind. For this one, the key fact is that once they get to that encapsulated cover treatment, there's some really new ceramic cements out there and other different ways of taking different compounds and turning the whole thing into a non-porous clay that won't leach. I'm pretty confident the chemistry that they need to do this stuff is already here developed. We won't have that problem. What we do want to see from this project is that these funds that are coming here to fix a problem that's been caused not by any individual here go to develop community to make sure that the jobs stay in this area. And if we need to put together hazardous waste training programs so that our people can work on the site, well, that's just what we're <coughs> going to do is put together those programs. There is a lot of things in Southern Oregon that we like to complain about, but we have some opportunities here to develop some cottage industries locally. 
especially the biochar industry, because look how close this burn last year came to Glendale. You can walk through Glendale and see trees that were burned. That's how close it came to wiping out the town, Glendale. Glendale is on the upside of this problem. Riddle is on the downside of the problem. And everybody wants to see the problem fixed. So I think that if we can form a local, federal partnership and make sure that Judy, Chris, and all their people get our help to solve the problem, and we get behind them, not only do we solve the problem, but we really jumpstart the economic growth of Douglas County, and Jackson County, and Josephine County, and Coos County, and Curry County, and that's what we're all here for, is to let's get this engine running, and let's get back to the 1970s, when this area was the top per capita income in the nation, not the bottom. Thank you.
How do you do, how you make the roots get healthy and strong? You give it biochar. Not just grass, but trees too. I've proven the trees can very easily be grown. Thank you for your time. because we are the real thing. And um, biochar has been around for a long, long time. So I think it's the cat's meow for what you have happening there. For one thing, it is a real absorbent. It is a soil amender. It holds the, min the minerals um, and the water, but it also will absorb, hold the water from leaching, I believe. I think it's going to be pretty good on that. So, um, I would like to say, give us a talk to. This young man seems to know something about it. We are not in, into it for money at all. We want to teach people how to use it. And we are for creating jobs. And there can be a lot of jobs created. What we're doing is we're working with um, the Tiller District in, in restoration project to um, make biochar out of the slash that's up there that they just torch and there goes all the carbon in the sky. Biochar is a real um, carbon sequestration. I mean, it holds the carbon in the soil also. So um, I just think that it really, really has a place in this project. Great. So is there anyone additional who would like to make a couple of comments this evening? Well, seeing then what we'll do is I'll conclude the public comment portion and uh, we can continue answering questions and um, having open discussion um, if that is acceptable to everyone. Or you can go home. <laughs> <laughs> So Chris, why don't you come and put you here? I'll conclude the public comment section, and we can put you back on the hot seat okay. for anybody. Oh, but yeah. <laughs> Since I haven't, I wasn't able to download, so I couldn't read the plan. What is your straight up assessment on the success of? I assume there's a preferred alternative, right? Yeah, the preferred alternative is what I'm going to explain. Okay. That wasn't very clear, though. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no worries. So, what is your straight up assessment on the success? I think we've done this many places. Um, and my examples are Colorado and you know Idaho. They're doing yeah. some stuff. And, moving activity. I mean, you can build a repository that you can prevent water from infiltrating. That's kind of what we're trying to do. In a very wet environment? Well, this is not a very wet environment compared to... Well, it's wetter than Utah and parts of Idaho. Yes, it is. Um, but it's probably... It's not, it's not like Western. 20, it's not like the rain or something. Yeah. But it's still... Right, no, no, absolutely. No. We, you know, making landfill covers is not difficult. The issue really is the permanence, and when I say permanence, I mean 10,000 years. And, you know, that's a difficult thing to get people's hands around, but if you say we're going to leave this here permanently, it's permanent. Um, there's no way around that. Um, but no, we think we can do this work. And that's one of the issues that I, I'm very intrigued with this discussion on biochar. I'm sure it is effective at doing what it's designed to do, but we also care that it goes down 30 feet. We need to make sure the water that's getting down there doesn't leave that material out. So EPA wants something more permanent, and that's why we're proposing this, because even though it's engineered, we think we can design this thing 
to do to achieve that goal. Um, it's the, you know, it's inert material. It doesn't settle once you put it down. And we have to, you know, put it down in layers, compact it, do all that engineering-wise. But it's not like a landfill that has organic waste in it. It's going to putress and decompose and, you know, have different settlement properties. Um, well, I just think we wouldn't propose it if we didn't think it was going to work. And, you know, they wouldn't give me $10 million to do it if they thought it was a half baked idea. I just want to make a second. Yeah, I, I get a sense here that this is a um, everybody, we're ready to conclude a uh, formal meeting and just go to discussion because we have lots of different discussions going. So, do you want to? We also have a copy of the documents all here in the Riddle Library. That yes. helps too. So, the board is basically like physical BRI. So, it might take a long time to download the app. I could download the Whether your system or the RF. Yeah, no. Thank you.